Okay, it's six o'clock plus two minutes. So, uh, pardon me? Okay, well, I'm just going to do a little quick intro. And the person that just said, one more person just drove in, we'd like to welcome. We have Robert Schmidt from the Tierra Grande chapter in Alpine with us tonight. He visited the center today and Ed Mesa told him that we were going to have a meeting tonight. And so he's asked to join us and he's being very helpful. And so we're happy that he's here. <laughs> and for all the people online, we wish you were here, but we're happy that you're online. And I just counted how many people are in the room and it's about 20 including some of the mentors. So we're everybody, uh, it, we're happy that it's not as cold as it's been, thank goodness. And tomorrow will be better, but I did wanna let you know that um, two of our trainees are with Sea Turtle and they've been out day and night helping rescue over 700 stranded turtles. So they won't be here tonight, but what, their mentor was very concerned that they were going to miss class. And I just want all of you to know that we built in a couple extra classes at the end because some something, not sea turtle stranding isn't always the reason, but something always happens that prevents somebody from coming to class. So we will also share our classes with the other chapter and vice versa. So there's, you won't come up short on your hours for class. Um, I wanted to let you know that we have a total of 29 trainees and we sent you the speaker schedule. I had three more of them confirmed today, so we're just about done. I'll send you the final version. It hopefully it'll look just like it does, but with a name in the speaker slot. Um, we're putting together field trips and in the first thing we do is try to schedule the hardest to schedule field trips. And so once they get a date locked down, then we schedule the easy ones like me doing a plant walk at Ramsey and things like that. We schedule those around the really difficult ones. So um, I want to let you know that I take role. I take it at the beginning of class and then I take it at the second half of class. I, and so that I know you're here. If you're having any issues, please text me. We can't, I, I can't check my email during class, uh, but text Robert or me. Robert's our technical person, but uh, we can try to help you. It doesn't seem like anybody had any trouble logging on tonight, but uh, if you do, and if you have to miss a class, let me know. That way we can work on getting that taken care of, you know, what, what you can do to, to um, take care of that. Um, also, if you're on your phone and you're not using the app, I, I may ask you who, the, who this number is because some of, some of them only show up as a phone number. But if you use your phone that is in your profile, then I can match it to that. Um, I think that's all I needed to say, but we're really glad you're here and welcome tonight. And then I'm going to pass it off to our president, Robin, and she's going to talk to you about the TMN program and the history of it. Hi, I want to welcome you to the Texas Master Naturalist program. This is the orientation for that. And welcome to the Rio Grande Valley chapter. I am the, uh, I was elected as the president for this year. I was class of 2019. I really enjoyed it. I think it's a great program. And I look forward to all of you getting involved and learning as much as I did. What do we do? What do, what do the Texas master naturalists do? Well, we care for our environment, 
we create better places to live. We want to learn something new. That's part of our mission is to be educated and learn. And once we learn it, our job is to educate others, to teach others, old and young, about what we just learned. You know, we don't have to be experts. We don't have to be masters in the field. We just need to be able to talk to people, to get them to understand that the natural resources are important. And then we celebrate our achievements and we adapt to changes. So we have a lot of partners down here. We're very, very fortunate. A lot of people we can volunteer for and with. We got the Friends of Laguna Atascosa, Journey North. Journey North um, has talks about um, monarchs. We got the East Foundation that we volunteer. Both state parks, the Rizaca de la Palma and uh, Estellana Grande. I always have trouble with that name. It doesn't roll off my tongue. Um, <laughs> Alta Palmas Battlefield. Arroyo, Colorado, we've got lots of places in the island to volunteer, Sea Turtle Inc. or the South Padre Island Birding Center. We've got the place that you're here right now, you can volunteer here at the San Benito Wetlands, Coastal Bend, and okay, I've had another one up there, but it's okay. There's plenty. And what do, why do we do it? We do it so we can educate people about the natural resources, about the endangered species, about the monarchs, about the Texas tortoise that we have, the pelicans, and the fora and the fonta that we have. It's very unique down here. Very unique of Texas and very unique for the country. So who's our sponsors? Well, the program started with Texas Parks, um, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and they made a partnership with Texas A&M AgriLife. And that partnership developed into Texas Master Naturalist Program. Now, Texas Parks and AgriLife are, prohibit the discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, disability, age, and gender. And we are an apolitical um, organization. So if you want to take a political stand about the LNGs, you do not do that with your t and outfit on. We are apolitical when we have our t and badge on, a t and hat, or t and shirt. We are volunteers to educate the public. Apolitical. When you take all that stuff off, if you have a really strong feeling, that's fine. You can voice it as a private citizen, OK? Um, but we need to be aware of that. Our mission, our mission is to develop uh, well-informed volunteers that provide education, outreach, service, dedicated to the benefit and the management of natural resources and natural areas in our communities for the state of Texas. So that's what we're here for. I hope everybody sort of had an understanding of that when they signed up. And I welcome you to the first class. And this is your first class of 30 hours that you will learn about things. You don't have to be a master of everything. You can be, just because you have a love for the environment, that's all that's required. OK, well, whoops, I went backwards. Let's go forwards. Why t &M? Well, it was developed because a lot of communities have to like rely on volunteers. They're always a short supply of well-informed volunteers to help with the operations of parks, natural centers, natural areas. And so this is an educational program that was put together through that partnership so that we could, in the state of Texas, have informed volunteers to help out the park systems. So the history, in 1997, San Antonio had a group of people get together and they wanted to develop uh, the Texas Master Naturalist Program, but at that time it wasn't called that. And they asked to join the Texas Master Gardeners 
The Texas Master Gardeners is also a very well established program, but the gardener program that we're modeled after didn't really have enough room to put in the natural resource aspect to it. Their classes were already booked, already had a full curriculum. So then they developed the Texas Master Naturalists. And they had a, the first statewide program was developed in March of 1998. That's when the first program. And then they got the four, first state coordinator in 1999. Our chapter, the Rio Grande Valley chapter, was established in 2002. We grew um, significantly. And we had over 200 members. And in 2012, we had our first class in mission. Well, mission's a long way away. But we had a class over there. And then they decided that, hey, that's too far to drive. <laughs> we could establish another chapter. There was enough members over in Hidalgo County that they could establish a new chapter member group. So they did. They established one in 2015, and it's known as the South Texas Border Chapter. Now, you can take classes online. They also have one of these classes airing at the same time we do. It's not online. Oh, it's not online. OK. It's in person on Thursdays. But their classes do count or would count for AT if you wanted to take them. Um, the program celebrated its 20th year in 2018. Um, South Texas border celebrated their fifth year in 2020. We celebrated our 20th year in 2022. And this last past year, we had the 25th year anniversary of the program. So that's what our program for the Rio Grande Valley looked like. Those are a bunch of pictures of our members doing things that they like to do. So our goals, our goals is to improve the public's understanding of natural resources, ecology and management. And it's to enhance the existing natural resource education and outreach activities. So that's the goal. And to develop a statewide network that's efficient and effective. So that's why we have a state coordinator up in Austin. And actually, we have two coordinators. So volunteers, what can you do as a volunteer? You can write newsletters about trees and efficiency and ecology. You can do a field survey for Texas tourists. You can do a beach cleanup. There's all kinds of things you can do. You can work for our conservation partnerships. We can we do eBird, which is science and bird data collection. So there's lots of things that you can do. If you don't find something you like, I'm sure you'll find something else you like. You know, we all have different, um, different things we like to do. And there's room for every one of you in the program. We assist with field work on endangered species. We've got some ocelot work going on. We do interpretive programs. We've got a couple people running the tram at Rizaki de la Palma at the state parks. We have pollinator gardens that are being established here at uh, South Texas Ecosystem, as well as at Laguna Atascosa Nature Center. Um, there's people doing uh, sea turtle patrols at Sea Turtle Inc., but now they're doing coal stun. So there's lots of room and lots of activities that you can do. So what of our impact? Well, you know, how do we affect the natural environment? Right now, instead of that of one lonely chapter in 1997, we've gotten 48 chapters in the state of Texas. We're in 213 counties. Last year, well, in 2022, we trained 718 new members. But from the date of 1998, we've trained over 16,000. How many hours have we contributed? Over half a, mil, a half a million. And in just 2022, and then to date, it's over 6.3 million 
So we do have a major impact. And on the youth we impact, we've reached youth, adults, and private landowners over close, close to 250 of those. And we've developed new trails at parks. We've done stewardship projects on 40 acres. And if you look at the value per dollar, they put a value on every dollar that you volunteer. So in 2022, that value was $11 million that went into the natural resources. And to date, it's been over 146. So we do have a big impact. That's our logo for 2023. That was our 25th anniversary logo. And what you do when you um, join the program, every year there's a recertification pin and there's a recertification um, requirement. So this year, or 2023, just last year, we had the Tech Texas ecosystem which is up there in the corner. This year, you'll get a golden, Western golden back rattlesnake as your little recertification pin. So um, you earn certification pins, you will earn um, recognition pins for the number of hours that you put in. I meant to wear my, my lasso, but I don't have it with me. It's in the back, so. But you get a pin, a uh, dragon, dragonfly for the major milestone. So. And from Texas, we were the first ones to establish a Texas Master Naturalist Program. To date, 40 other states have Texas Master Naturalist Programs, all the way from Connecticut to Hawaii to Montana. So it's a program that has brought on a lot of, has a, a lot of good things from it. Our two chapters, um, the Rio Grande Valley chapter, basically we deal with Cameron County and Willacy County and a core, like a little half of Hidalgo County. And the South Texas border chapter is pretty much in Hidalgo and, and Star. So, how do you certify to become a Texas Master Naturalist? Well, you started it tonight. You started it by your training. You come in, you do 30 hours of training, and you do the 10 hours of field work that Barbara will set up for you, and you'll become a trainee. And once you're trained, that's, that's well-educated, that's that part, you volunteer. The requirement is that you do 40 hours of volunteer in a year and you have eight hours of AT. And that, once you complete those, you'll be a certified master naturalist. And then every year, that's a requirement. To stay certified, you will have to complete eight hours of AT and do 40 hours of volunteer and pay your dues. They're not very much, but you still have to pay them. <laughs> so how do you get the AT hours? You can attend our chapter meetings, and they happen once a month on the second Tuesday of the month. Or you can join online um, t and Tuesday. It's a state program. It's at noon. And so you can listen to them, and that's an hour long. So there's plenty of room to get AT hours. This is another little mini series that they're putting on this year. It's called, they're, do, they're trying to do some acoustic um, monitoring for Texas bats. So there'll be a mini series on the 23rd. So you can sign up and take that one as well. And then there's a mini series on INAT. So that's also a, a good one that, where you can get your AT hours. Now, how do you get volunteer hours? Well, the chapter is going to have a volunteer fair right here in March on the second Tuesday. I think it's March the 13th. And so you can come and you can visit all the local partners that we have that will be here. And you can find out how you can volunteer for them. But the state also has a volunteer fair in April. 
So that's their volunteer fair in April. And you can get volunteer hours from any of our partners. And there is a list of partners on our website. So if you need a, I'll get to the website here in a minute. You can also get AT hours and volunteer if you go to the, the state fair. Now the state fair this year is in San Marcos, October 24th through the 27th. And they, if it's anything like the, the annual fair that was annual meeting that was here last year, it's really fantastic. They, they have, will have over, I think it's like a three or four day event. They'll have over 120 speakers. They'll have over, you know, 10 to 20 field trips that you can go on. And it's a real camaraderie. You'll meet somebody from all the chapters from the whole state. So it's pretty cool. And then there's our website. Our stuff, the Rio Grande Valley chapter information is on the your right-hand side. And the state information is on the left-hand side. So those are our websites, our Facebook page. We have um, the email. And we have a YouTube site. So if you want, you take a picture of that, or I'm sure Barbara can make sure that you get those. I see picture, pic, pictures being taken, so I'll wait a minute. <laughs> but there's a lot of good information out there. Um, Talk to your mentors. I think this year everybody's gotten assigned a mentor. If your mentor hasn't contacted you yet, um, they should here within the next week. Um, they've been asked to contact you, help you find volunteer opp opportunities, and help you with logging all that into the VMS system. So in summary, I want to just welcome you to the Rio Grande Valley chapter. We're excited to have you. Um, I hope you enjoy the in-class and the field trips as much as I did in 2019. And Robert's going to come up here and talk to you a little bit about the VMS. The question was, there was a question on the apolitical aspect of the organization. We are an educational program, uh, program and a volunteer program where we can provide services, but we're not supposed to take a political stand. There are hot button issues when it comes to environmental issues. And you can go far right and you can go far left. And as a TNM member, you are sort of supposed to be neutral. You're supposed to be in the middle. You're supposed to be able to talk about the issues and let that person that other person make their own decisions on that issue. Um, right. And, and so if you want to take one side or another real hard, you just take off anything that has a TNM name tag on you, and then you can talk about it all you want. But as a TNMer, you are neutral. And I know that's a, that's a fine line to walk. I've walked it for 30 years in my, my career as an environmental scientist for a lot of different people. I used to work at EPA and used to work for Textile. And so um, you just have to look at the issues with um, a neutral line. Okay, great. So, okay, so I wanna introduce VMS. I had sent out a link for everyone to take a look at VMS from a video that we presented. And I want to touch on a bunch of the, the main points. One of the things that we realize is VMS and recording your hours is something that it takes a while before it kind of, okay, I get it. I get it. So, I mean, in fact, I'm going to repeat some of the things that Robin said just because, again, we're, we're, it's a common theme that it's like, okay, how does that work again? What hours are here? What goes there? And so we'll repeat this over and over again and as long as you guys need it. So VMS, Volunteer Management System, this is our hours management, hours tracking system. You either like it or you hate it. It's a necessary evil. But I will tell you that from the time, so I joined the Master Naturalist program in 2014. 
when it was a spreadsheet that you would send to some people that would log that information for you, for us. I mean, the, it, it was very crude. And so this system used by Texas Parks and Wildlife is good enough. And I, for one, would hate for them to invest too much money on making it really great and special because get that money can go somewhere else. So it's a it's a necessary evil. Now you may become you may begin accumulating volunteer time and advanced training time as of the end of today. So we originally had thought that great once we once you're in the class you're able to begin logging hours, and we were mistaken because it's the orientation that's sort of that starting line. Last year we did a virtual orientation, and so we got to do this a week ago or a week before we're doing it now, but. Some one of those lessons learned was the orientation face to face is a lot, in my opinion, a lot better. And you can you can hear it from us. You can ask questions from us. So as of today, you can start logging some of your time into the system. So you get to the point that you are going to have hours to report. That's the starting point. So Robin touched on the training. The only time that you get to log in training hours is right now as a training for the, this year's class. People that have already gone through the program don't even see the training opportunity show up in BMS to log that. So uh, Joni, who you'll get to know, Joni Gillis is our uh, volunteer management system person. And so she's the one that loads into BMS the things that you see as opportunities. And so she makes sure that she knows who, this, who the trainees are, who the students are, and you have a category to log your training hours. So is it a class that you wish to record? And if so, you're going to find a category in BMS called initial training classes. And that is where your time tonight is going to be recorded to. So you log into BMS, you go and select an opportunity to log in, and you're gonna find that initial training class for tonight. Now, if, if it's one of the field trips, you'll see a different category, and that's where your two categories of training time comes. So you got 30 hours of training class that we're going to want to see you accumulate and then 10 hours worth of field trip time. So these are the two categories within the BMS that you'll look at. And again, if, if any questions, go back to that video that's out there. We created it so you can play it over and over again until you can memorize all the, all my, my statements in there if you wish. Two training events, field trip and this class, you do not get to count travel time, unfortunately. So any time that it took for you to get here, any time that it takes for you to get to a field trip, whichever county we set up does not count towards your training. It's the actual start time of 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. and so on, so on that counts. Now, after this class, after you've gone through the training, then this is where that term that you will hear over and over again, advanced training or AT comes into place. So that is one category that we, as, as have, having gone through the program, we're either going to log it as advanced training or volunteer time. So for advanced training, you're going to attend a lecture, you're going to go to a chapter field trip, and that's what qualifies as advanced training. And I'll share a little bit about exactly what is advanced training. If you are going to log advanced training in BMS, then you look for the category that is labeled AT. And I'm going to show you what those look like as well. So if it's advanced training that you're logging, that's where it's going to go. The only thing left, and again, advanced training, you don't include travel time. So if you're, it could be a virtual event, which is great, there's no travel involved, but if you're going to an advanced training class somewhere, you don't count that travel time. So the only thing left is volunteer time. And as volunteer time, you provided a service to either the chapter, because you're on a committee, you're volunteering to help out with an event, or you actually provided a service to one of our partners. Now, there's a category of volunteer time called field research. So one of the things that we'll talk about is that we as master naturalists love doing citizen science. We love contributing to the collection of data for whatever that project is that people are working on. So if you are doing field research, it has its own category for logging your time. But if it's not, then, that, then you're gonna see that entire list of volunteer categories to choose from. And I'll show you those in a little bit. So field research means you're working on a project, you're helping out, um, doing some sort of bird banding, you're doing some sort of monarch tracking, you're doing some sort of initiative that has this project surrounding it. So that's the field research part. Anything else? Again, I'll show you those categories is volunteer time. 
So again, you choose the right field research and, and we may loosely call it citizen science or field research, but in VMS, it always begins with FR. And that stands for field research. You do get to include travel time. So if you want to volunteer at the Butterfly Center in Mission, and you're on the island and you drive all the way to Mission to help out at one of their events, guess what? Keep a track, start your stopwatch as soon as you leave home until you get back. Now, if it's an all day event and you take an hour for lunch, don't count that hour. But if from the moment that you leave home to go help out at a volunteer event or at a field research project, you count from the moment that you leave home. So, so keep track of that. And, and that's, that, that helps a lot. And that means that we want to support you volunteering. If you are on the island and you want to spend at least one day a month out at the Edinburgh Scenic Wetlands, go for it. We want to reward you for the fact that you're willing to travel that far to give them a hand. Now, we have VMS approvers that are part of our chapter that have volunteered to say that now that you've logged all your time, I'm going to go back and review what you logged. Did you do it correctly? And if so, they may send you an email, or if not, they may send you an email and say, hey, by the way, you forgot the name of the event, or you forgot the name of the person that did the presentation, something like that. Or they might say, you know what, actually, this is not a volunteer. This should have been field research. Or no, that's actually advanced training, and so on and so on. Uh, they, will, they will review it, and if it looks good, they approve it. Now, within DMS, from the moment, for example, for tonight, you have a 45-day window to record your training for tonight. On day 46, it's gone. So we always remember that you have this 45-moving window that you can log your time. My best advice is, is do it as soon as you can. Whether you want to do it once a week, have a little notepad or something that you're logging what you've done and log it Saturday night while you're watching something on TV, great. I, I do it before I go to bed tonight, I'll log today's activity. That just gets you into the good, useful habit and you don't risk losing time. For your training, you'll never get day one of day one's class again. And there's a fixed number of classes that we offer. So you definitely don't want to lose class time. You definitely don't want to lose field trip time to this 45-day window. And as part of what Barbara and I will do is we will remind you, we will hound you, we will beat you until you log your time. Because we don't want you to lose that time. Okay? Now, I, we talk about advanced training. We do have a set of guidelines from the state that, that defines what is considered advanced training. And one of the key parts is that it has to be interactive. So it cannot be just something, some great webinar that talks about the, the bird migration across the country or anything else like that, a recording. It needs to be live with your capability, whether you ask a question or not, but if it's an online session, you must be able to have the capability to ask the presenter a question. And as long as that's true, it qualifies for AT. However, it also has to fit the rest of the qualifications that we look for. And in essence, I can summarize all those 10 criteria is that does it fulfill or does it support our mission as master naturalists? And if it does, nine times out of 10, it's going to help us. It also has to be specific to our region. So if it is something that has to do with black bears in West Texas, no unless we know that there's a black bear that was spotted here, it will never qualify. Okay, so it has to be relevant to what we do. Now, if they're talking about the impacts of the environment and climate change on animals in Texas, and they use the black bears as an example, then we have room to work with, because they are tackling the big problem that we're faced with down here too. Their subject may be somewhere else in Texas, but guess what, it may still apply, because what's happening in different parts of Texas may impact us. If it is a presentation in Austin about bird migration, guess what? We're one of those highways where the birds are going to come through. So even though they're talking about something specific in Austin, the topic that they're sharing, bird migration and the impact of habitat, we face that here every day. When in doubt, we do have a director that's responsible for advanced training, Teresa. You can ask her or any of the officers. And while you're in the training or for the next whole year, you can ask Barbara and myself. Hey, I found this, what do you think? 
And this is the criteria that we sort of look at it. This, these are, this is the lens that we look at to see, does it qualify for advanced training? There's one exception, TMN Tuesday. So this is presented by the program. Watch this talking. So this is one of the state programs that Robin mentioned. This is the only one that qualifies that if you miss January's TMN Tuesday, you can go back and watch it and get credit for advanced training. So this is the only exception to the rule that it must be live. So realistically, by the end of the year, you have 12 hours of TMN Tuesdays to go look, and you can easily make up any advanced training that you're missing. So this is a, a great win-win for us. It makes it pretty easy. And the topics are really good. So go out there and take a look at TMN Tuesday. I think that's an easy way for us to, add, to earn advanced time. And like Robin said, our chapter meetings, so between these 12 and our 12 chapter meetings, AT should not be a problem. What happens with all of us is, oh, but I want to go hear that one. Oh, I love that one. I like that topic too. All of a sudden you got two dozen 80 hours every year that it just becomes really easy. TMN Tuesday is the only exception to that rule. Correct. Thank you, Robin. So Robin mentions that it's only valid for that calendar year. I would recommend you go take a look at 2023, and there are some very good and interesting topics, but only 2024 TMN Tuesdays qualify for the year 2024. Thank you, Robin. Robin mentioned partners. We have a, on our website, we have a list of partners that we've tried to document. If you want to get involved now before the uh, virtual volunteer fairs, you can take a look at our website. We have a lot of partners that we work with. Uh, Susan, in fact, was involved in one of the projects to try to document some of those things. Who are the main contacts that, if you want to help out the Arroyo Colorado Audubon Society because you love birds, Go to, the, go to our website, go to that link, and you'll see a form of who the contacts are, what do they do, what are, are they interested, what could they use help with. And so we've tried to document as many of, us, of our partners that, are, that we have, uh, and there's still many more that we can add to this list. So take a look at that. Again, we bring up hours, we'll bring up hours again. I want to email you about hours until you're like, okay, fine, I know. But... To graduate, you need 30 hours of class time, 10 hours of field trip time, okay? Once you do that, once you graduate, you're a Texas Master Naturalist, period, okay? You graduate the program. What we look for is that additional 40 hours of volunteer time, eight hours of advanced training in order for your initial certification. And those initial certification is that first time that a trainee gets certified. And we'd love to celebrate you guys being able to achieve that. So that takes volunteer time and eight hours. And as Robin said, every year, the annual re recertification asks for 40 more volunteer hours and eight more advanced training hours. The very first year you're in the program is the only time that you get to earn initial certification and then get the double reward for the extra effort to get your annual certification that same year. So that is certainly something to shoot for. So on I'll show you the spreadsheet that you're going to see over and over again is part of the target that I would challenge you to is earn 80 hours of volunteer time and 16 hours of AT in order to achieve both of these milestones. Because after your first year, you don't get to do that kind of double certification. You only get the annual certification. If you achieve this, then you can call yourself a certified Texas Master Naturalist. Now, many members will, in a year, Life happens, you get busy with work, get busy with other things. You may let your certification lapse, but you're still a Texas Master Naturalist. When times get better, jump right back in and earn your certification, recertification for that year. So now that you are in the class, you can work on your training hours and certification. All you have to do is say, you know what, I'm, I'm attending the class, I'm going to field trips, but I'm gonna go ahead and volunteer here. They all can always use help here. 
you love going out there and pulling weeds, we got weeds here that we can definitely pull out or any of our other partner sites. We can get engaged now. No double dipping. You cannot charge that same hour as both AT and volunteer time. Okay. Now you may go and say, let's say you're going to talk to Robin and say, look, I would like to volunteer to help out with the chapter meetings. This is what I can do. And so part of that chapter meeting, you might say out of that hour or two hours, I'm going to log this amount of time for volunteer work. But then once the meeting started, I sat there and I learned and I listened. And so I get to do AT. But you're not going to cover those two hours you spent double, right? You can certainly split up your time. But you can't double dip. Now, if you work at one of our partner sites and you get paid for what you do, you cannot log that as volunteer time or advanced training time. If you work for the parks department and you get this great idea, you can work on a project there with them, but you can't log it as volunteer time. Now, as soon as your 5 p.m. clock hits and you clock out and you decide to stay here an extra half hour to be able to pull weeds, go for it. And so one thing that we don't do, this is, a, this is totally an honor system. Nobody's going to be watching over your shoulder to figure out what you're doing. So definitely ask questions as you run into any of these situations or scenarios, and we'd love to help you out. But we, we totally believe in what you do. The only thing that we require, I mentioned that there's people that check entries into VMS. The reason is those hours that Robin mentioned in the front are the same hours that we will use to apply for grants. It will be the same hours that we love to share about what we do in the Rio Grande Valley as our chapter. And so we do want to make sure the hours are accurate. And some of those grants will actually come back and say, show me the hours. Show me what you did. And for some of those federal grants, we don't want to upset anybody. So we want to make sure that it's accurate. This is the spreadsheet you're going to see me send you over and over and over again. This is what we'll use to track how many hours of initial training I see within VMS that you've logged, how many field trip hours you have logged, and whether you're working on volunteer and AT already. And so I send this out almost every week on a week on a weekly basis. I just said that. So I send this out weekly so that you can sort of track yourself. And you, I'll start changing colors as you achieve a milestone. Once you hit, let's say, 10 hours of field trips, I will send you a reminder to say, hey, you're welcome to attend the next field trip. But guess what? That's going to be advanced training for you because you've already hit the max. Uh, and so you'll start to see this over and over again, just coming from us as we sort of track this, because we want to make sure you graduate. We want to make sure that you can get that initial certification. This is what the volunteer management system page looks like that you'll go into. Once you click on the, the, the BMS volunteer login, that's what the login is going to look like. When you applied into the program, it asked you for a username and password. If you're like everybody else, you forgot what that was. But that's the username and password you will use to log into the BMS system. If you forgot, shoot us an email. We're happy to tell you what it is. And sometimes, oh, yeah, I remember doing that, and I remember the password. But if you're like the rest of us, you forgot the password too, we'll, we'll reset it and send you the link so you can reset it. But that same username and password that you use to apply, that's what you'll use to get into the BMS system. Once you log in, this is what it looks like. The two main sections I sort of highlighted are the ones that you're most interested in. The logbook is where you can see what you've entered, what has been approved, and you can monitor your own progress at reaching those hours that I mentioned. The report my service is this is where you log your time, whether it's class time, training time, and advanced training or volunteer time. So if I go to report my service and I click, I want to record my time. Somebody said, oh my God, yeah. Now, this is really small, but on your laptop or computer, you can blow it up and you can scroll. But this is, to me, part of the challenge is that it can be very confusing. But once you start logging, you start identifying, oh, yeah, I see that section that says AT. I see the section that says FR for free research, which is citizen science. Then it gets easier. And like for most of us, we keep using the same five or six over and over and over again. So it gets better. Okay. And, but they're not, they don't, like right now they're seeing them. Okay. So. 
slow. What? <laughs> Okay, so this is one of the things I would have pointed at. Is okay. Here's the AT section. So, so this this AT section. I'm going to go back. It, oh, right now on that list. Uh, oh wait. So they're stuck on this. Okay. So so I'll wait until it catches up. Let me know when it catches up. But on the next slides, what I'm going to show you are the AT section, the FR section. Because once you start to identify that and you know you're trying to log AT time, that's where it's going to show up. When you're logging FR field research, uh, citizen science projects, FR is where you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. So this first section is are the ATs, the advanced training. Good. So this advanced training section, and you'll see these different categories of what kind of AT did you attend? Was it the chapter meeting? Was it TMN Tuesday? The state meeting, that's that annual meeting. Well, guess what? You don't get to use that for until next state meeting. So you can even kind of ignore that one. Was it at a chapter event? Did you went to and attend a, a presentation at Sea Turtle Link? Was it a virtual? Was this a Texas Parks and Wildlife virtual presentation? These are the different categories that you'll pick from. And I'll show you a little bit of, of how you can decide which one do I use. Next section, you'll see, you'll, you'll begin to identify again, begins with FR, field research. These are your citizen science projects. So some of the examples here is, did you uh, participate in the Christmas bird count? Did you participate in the, the backyard feeder count? You'll notice that there's a bird count, including surveys. Did you go and help at a bird banding event? So that is that first category. And we have several that are in there. And I'll show you again how you can sort of determine which one is the one that I should use. Yes? Will the February range that? So that'll be your first category up there, that FR bird count surveys, bandings. And so those are examples of, of the type of citizen science project that that would fit under. Um, the Texas Stream Water Quality Monitoring You'll see some more information later on about that, but that's yet a different certification that you can pursue. And that's that advanced training that you can log that time to. Uh, and again, the things that you'll get used to is, oh, if, it's, if it's bird banding, boom, I know which one to go to. All others, go to this one. And just give it time and you're gonna get to see what they are and you're gonna get to use those two or three pretty consistently that it won't be, a, oh my God, what the hell do I do? So it'll get better. Now for you in the class, you have a special category for reporting your time in class and reporting time in field trip. I don't have that on my VMS system. Your mentors will not have that in their VMS system because you've already gone through the program. You will have it loaded into yours because this is where you'll log your time for tonight, log your time for next Wednesday and so on and so on. For field trips, this is where it will go. So make sure you pick that section. And there's only those two that you can choose from. Everything else is volunteer. If it's not advanced training, if it's not field research, if it's not your training, then all the other categories that you saw on that huge list are the ones to choose from for that volunteer activity that you did. Which ones to choose from can again be a little bit confusing. And the best that I'm gonna show you is, is there's descriptions that are in the system that once you select it gives you a clue as to is this the right one or not. And when in doubt, that's why the mentors are assigned to you. That's why we are here, so that if there's any question, it's like, man, I don't know if this one's it, that we can explain it to you. This is, an, this is a necessary evil that we don't love, but we learn to use it and, and we accept it. And for what we need it for, it does it, its job. So we have all these different categories. It would have been nice if all of these were like in a volunteer section or had some sort of initial at the front, like FR or AT but they don't, so they're kind of spread out a bit. Did you guys done? So when you pick, 
when you pick one of the opportunities, you will see a section that comes up that kind of describes it for you, gives you examples of what they are, and it tells you what you need to make sure to do record in the description. So when in doubt, click on one, read that. Because chances are that if you were pulling weeds at Ramsey, we have Ramsey as one of the examples there. And it's like, okay, this must be the one I need to use. So we try to include as much detail into the description so that you can say, okay, this is the one I need. Now, when you go in, select the opportunity, it's going to automatically put today's date. So one of the common mistakes we, we kind of send back to trainees is, class was on Wednesday, it wasn't on Thursday, it wasn't on Friday. So by default, the system picks today's date, but you might be recording yesterday's training. So watch out for that. So if you do it on a Saturday night, everything you did all week, that's great. Just make sure you pick the day that it actually happened. Because one of the things, we do get an audit every year, and we do get dinged for any kind of obvious mistake that happens. You can also not log this ahead of time. So today at lunchtime, you decide, you know what, I'm gonna to go to class, I'm gonna log my three hours now. We get dinged for that too. Because once you make your entry in the history log, it timestamps what you did, and auditors love catching us doing stuff like that. So just don't, don't do it. Mr. Gaitan. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, I was looking at the 30 hour of initial volunteer hours required, um, right, correct for us. So today it's going to be counted at three hours, correct? It'll be three hours for initial class time. Initial class time meaning today, right? Yes, today. Okay. And so, then we, we have 11 times of initial class time, right? We will, we do have planned at least 11 classes, especially like Barbara mentioned, if you miss one, we wanna make sure that you can make it up. But even if you attend the required 30 hours, come back for that 11th class time and log that as advanced training, okay? Okay, it's not gonna be counted for anything else, right? It's gonna be 30 hours of initial training. And we do have some students that will log 33, and you'll get an email from me saying, you know what, I'd love to give you credit for the three hours of AT, change it. I think that'll be good for you. So keep that class training for 30 hours, and let's give you credit for AT because you came to the 11th meeting or the 12th meeting or what have you. Does that mean you can't teach one class? So the question is, can we skip one of those classes we did that on purpose because we know life happens. We know we didn't expect turtles to get cold stunned tonight or last night, but we know something happened. So we build into the plan that kind of buffer that if something happens, we want you to be able to make that time up. Uh, we do work with our sister chapter. Their, their training is in person, but if necessary, that might be something that you can do and say, you know what, I'll, I'm willing to go there to attend a class in person if they'll let me, because it's a topic that we haven't seen, so we can give you credit for it. But you need to make up a, make it up because, heaven forbid, you had a wreck or something happened. So we'll, we definitely try to work with everybody because we know things will happen and your schedules don't work out the way you want. And one of the ways that we did it is offer more classes than, than are there. And as we go through the training, week six, we may already know, you know what, let's add, add class number 12. Because we had these events happen that we know we need to make it up. Okay. Yes. This is kind of an aside question. But uh, Huawei is about to, prior to that, they're having a physical event. We're going out to ask us to follow up. So the question is regarding WAWE, which is not WAWE, but WWE, not to be confused with the wrestling, but WWE. Yeah, so they're having their event coming up. That is one of the opportunities that if you attend some of the sessions during those three days, 
that do count for advanced training. If you go on the field trip session before, I think they don't have any after, but the before ones, they, they also count as advanced training. Now, one of the things that we will try to do is we look at those opportunities and we will go to Robin and the rest of the board to say, these are the presenters, they're credible people, we know their quality of the work that they do, but if those count as field trips for them, because it's a very unique opportunity. You don't get to go to the Bahia Grande anytime you want to. And so those are things that we go back to Robin and the rest of the board to say, these are things that are happening over the next couple of months. What do you think? And we'll try to decide, do they count? They'll definitely count as advanced training, but it'd be great to give you those opportunities to make field trip time for classroom if the quality and the delivery of the, of the, the trip we think is worthy of that. So, and we'll update everybody on those things. But for anything, there's opportunities to volunteer at the event as well. And there's opportunity, opportunities to attend those sessions and earn AT time. So let me redouble this. Volunteering at the event and taking time off. So what, what I would tell you to is track the two, right? So you went in and, and volunteered from, I'm gonna make it up, eight to 12. But you attended one of the one hour sessions. So you're gonna split that time between how much, how much time did I spend volunteering and how much time did I actually spend uh, doing AT work? What I love to do is I love to go volunteer. I'll be a room monitor. I'll help them set up. I help greet them, help sit people. And then once things starts going, guess what? I sit there and I watch. So I volunteer for 20 minutes and the rest of my time is AT. Because I learned something just that counts too. Now, what we trust you to do is sort of track your time. I spent 15 minutes doing one thing with my volunteer hat, and then I spent the rest of the time as an AT student sitting there and learning. Because we realized that as a room volunteer, after a while, there's nothing to do except enjoy the presentation. Yeah. So we'll definitely work with you on some of those things. The main thing as you log that time in there, record it. 15 minutes, room monitor at the Huawei event, session was on ocelot conservation. Second entry, 45 minutes, uh, advanced to volunteer time. 45 minutes, AT attended the ocelot conservation presentation at Huawei. And so we trust you to, to sort of do those kinds of things. Yes, so what we're going to do is we're working on securing the field trips that require more planning. And then we fill in with trips to parks that we have greater flexibility. We will offer some during the week for those that can only meet during the week and offer some over the weekend. And we offer enough of them so that you can get your 10 hours in some shape or form. Uh, a lot of times we'll try to go to multiple sites, let's say on a Saturday. So in one Saturday, you could knock out five or six hours just on that one day because you visited three sites, did three tours, did three presentations. Uh, and again, don't forget that 45 day window. Don't lose whatever time in training or volunteer time that you had because that window keeps moving. And, and on day 46, that date, and the system is so funny because it'll let you log in that information and then it'll tell you at the end when you try to save it, this was 46, 45 days or beyond the 45 day window, sorry. You can tell me ahead of time. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, impact data on some of these entries where you're doing a volunteer service, there'll be an opportunity for you to record impact data. This is the audience that you interacted with. One of the stats that Robin mentioned was how many people that we contact with, how many were youth, how many were adults, how many interactions that we did, because that becomes a very valuable metric. And that's what we call impact data. So if you're sitting in, in this site and you're manning the table to greet people that are visiting the ecotourism center, every person that walks through is part of your impact data. Keep a little checkbox somewhere, a little piece of paper, or if you had to work at a place like this that already makes the people sign in, then hey, they're doing, they're doing the job for you because you all you have to do is go back and sort of look at how many people visited the ecotourism center. 
If you're greeting people at any of our partner sites or if you're greeting people at one of our events, uh, we're going to have that Ocelot Festival at the zoo like we do every year where you're going to ask folks to volunteer to help out. If you're there interacting with people, we're going to ask you to do your best at trying to remember how many people you saw because that's going to be tough and you're not going to have time to and trying to track, yeah, trying to track how many people becomes challenging. But when you do impact data, so up there you're going to have a field that says, do you need to add impact data? When you say yes, then that's where it gives you the opportunity to add how many, and we really care about the adults and the youth. So you want to be able to at least record the number of adults and the number of children that you saw at the event that you were at, that you were participating at. And like I said, your best guesstimate is often good enough. Because once you have those people moving in and out, it's like, I just couldn't track it. So we trust you to give us the best estimate at that. Oh. oh. So if three of you are, are volunteering here at, that, at this table, what we ask you is to decide amongst yourselves, will you record the impact data or do you want me to? because uh, we certainly don't want to double count the number of people we interacted. And so we do have that kind of uh, request that you work with each other. The challenge often happens is, let's say you're volunteering at Sea Turtle Link. And this will be something that Robin needs to help us figure out. If you're volunteering at Sea Turtle Link or the SPI Burning Center, and you're volunteering at the front as a greeter, Meanwhile, your partner is volunteering at the bird blind, helping people identify birds. I'm at the bird blind. You clocked in to volunteer at the front desk. I started at 8. You started at 9. You leave at 11. I leave at 12. I never saw you come in. I never got a chance to tell you, are you logging or am I? Are you counting the same people I saw at the bird blind? That becomes a challenge that we basically try to do the best we can to try to represent that. We don't want to make this so complicated, but we work at places, we volunteer at places that are very dynamic and, and that becomes a challenge and we recognize that. Uh, so sometimes I think, again, we'll, we'll have to chat with Robin on how do we handle those situations that we've been, we've been facing that over and over again, because it does become really tricky. The nice events where it's one table here and you have an easy entryway, it's, it's ideal. Uh, some of the categories that you'll find out there. If you volunteer at, a, at an organized beach cleanup, we have a category for that. So the amount of time that it took you to leave home, to go to the place that they're cleaning up, you spend the day there working, clean up trash, and then get home, that's all volunteer time. And you would pick the beach cleanup. And in the description, you would tell us what beach you were working at and who was the organization that put it together. Sometimes it's Sea Turtle Lane, sometimes it's some other organizations at different places. But you'll also find that we have a different category, and this is called pick up the valley. We recognize that if you pick up a piece of trash in mission, that prevents that piece of trash from flowing all the way into the Luna Madre. And so we're one of the few chapters that actually has this initiative to say, we need to take care of our trash no matter where it is because it affects our wildlife somewhere along the line. We've actually had chapters contact us to say, how did you justify that? Because we're trying to promote or ask our board to justify that and it's very simple, it's that watershed effect. And so if you are taking a walk at your neighborhood park at, around your, your block where you live at and you're picking up trash as you go, that's volunteer time. It's not just you enjoying a nice walk around the block, log it as volunteer time because all, all those pieces of trash that you put in the trash can don't make it out to some, some wildlife that's gonna eat it. So favorite park that you love to go to, take a grocery bag, pick up trash, that's volunteer time. We recognize that's really important. Absolutely. So if it's not organized, then pick up the valley is where you put it. So if you're enjoying a walk on the beach and you're picking up trash as you go, definitely. We want to thank you for doing that. If there is any risk to your life, we do not condone that. You cannot log that as volunteer time. Best example, is we do have volunteers that go out to Highway 48 during a cold front where they try to rescue the pelicans that can't make, cannot make it over the highway. So you have these big birds that can't fly over, so they're in the middle of the road with traffic doing 75 miles an hour. 
And we have enough volunteers that go out there and they try to rescue the birds as best as they can. Police will sometimes be there to help, or tell people to slow down, but we as a chapter cannot condone that because it is just simply too risky. Now, if you want to walk out into the Laguna Tascosa area where we're doing bird banding and, and risk your life being bitten by a rattlesnake, we condone that. That's okay. We just, we, we just don't want you to be hit by a car or other situations. We have projects that will ask you if you can document roadkill. That becomes really valuable for organizations like TxDOT. But we also ask you to do that with the best judgment that you're not racing across Highway 100 during stock show days at in Los Fresnos to try to document that roadkill. Because that, no, don't do that part. If it's a nice, easy road that you've seen something, definitely document it. And heaven forbid you never see an ocelot. We do want to know when you see one, but hopefully not as roadkill. Correct. So if you're doing something like the Pelican Rescue on Highway 48, you can, cannot log it as volunteer time. It, we understand why we need to do something like that, but as an organization, we can't support you risking your life to do that, unfortunately. Uh, there's two other categories. How much time do I have? Okay. Uh, training and education. This is where you have a fixed audience. So this is where I can log a presentation here at SPEC when I have a fixed room with a fixed audience that sits here and has to listen to me for an hour. Okay, that's training and education. If, if, it, if you're out at a table, like at the Ocelot, where your people are coming and going, that's actually a, an outreach event. So that's a different category. And those are two that we're often asked, which one do I log it to? And it all depends on what kind of audience you have. Your hours are logged in 15 minute increments. So if you pick up trash for 15 minutes, you log it in DMS at, as 0.25 hours. 30 minutes, 0.5. Now, if you wanna calculate what 3 eighths of 60 minutes is and stuff like that, it's like, no, don't do that. So if you spend you know, 13 minutes, round up to 15 and log it as a quarter hour. Okay, so that, that, that certainly makes my math a whole lot easier when I'm trying to figure out how many people, but it, we accept that the system can be very cumbersome and we appreciate the 15 minute uh, increment. Let us know if you need your username into VMS. Let us know if you need a reminder of what might be the password or we will reset it for you. VMS is something that's gonna sort of, the, the, when you start to use it, that's when your questions come, let us know. Okay, that's it for me. Okay, folks, as we, uh, as Javier sets up, uh, we have two advisors for our chapter. And tonight you get to hear from both of them. So Javier De Leon is a, uh, he went through our program, what year, Javier? 2005. 2005, thank you. Uh, so he's a master naturalist. Uh, he is he is the superintendent at Estero Llano Grande uh, State Park in Weslaco. Uh, he's a great advisor. He's been part of our program ever since I've been around. And so one of the great things that he does for us every year is be able to share with us the history behind the Master Naturalist uh, program a little bit more, but not necessarily just the program, but the naturalists that were here way before then. And so that's what he's gonna share with us is, is this history that we're a part of today. So with that, Javier, I'll pass it on to you. All right, thank you. Um... So yeah, thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, sorry, I can't be there in person. Uh, my wife just hit eight months of being pregnant and I want to stick close to home for a little bit. So, uh, but I do wish I was there with y'all. Y'all can hear me okay and everything. Okay, perfect. Yeah, hear you well, loud and clear. Let's go. Awesome, thank you, thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'll try to wrap it up here. I'll probably go maybe 10 minutes after eight. Um, I'll, I'll try not to though, but. Uh, it is a lot of stuff. Um, I should start with, uh, I'm really excited for you all. Uh, like Robert said, I, I took the class in, in 2005. And uh, back then I was a sophomore in college and it was really one of the first times um, that, uh, that I met other nature people. Um, 
I guess back then I, I didn't really, I really didn't grow up around a lot of nature people. I was kind of an oddball and, um, I went to UTRGV, but then UTPA in Edinburgh, and I was only one of maybe two or three nature people. Everybody else was pre-med. So when I, I met the other master naturalists in the class, I, I had found my, my folks, my, my people. So really excited for you all. Um, you know, uh, really, you know, hope you all get to know each other pretty well. I'm glad that you're having the classes um, in person and, you know, if you can't make it, you can get online sometimes, but really try to, to try to meet as everybody, right? try to meet everybody as much as you can. And hopefully you all get to know each other during field trips and they're wonderful memories. I know I still remember a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we, a lot of the classes and field trips that I did back in 2005 and I still, um, kept in contact with many folks over the years. So Texas master naturalist. So what is a naturalist? So according to our book, our textbook, which many of the chapters were written by master naturalists from across the state, the definition that they use is anyone who studies or appreciates an object or organism in nature. So <clears throat> I'm pretty sure everybody in the room um, can describe themselves as this. Um, you know, you might be very interested in studying uh, nature, plants or animals or rocks or something in nature. And I'm sure everybody here appreciates um, those objects or organisms in nature. So technically, uh, according to this definition, you might already be a naturalist. So, um, so yeah, but uh, you want to learn more, and that's a really big quality for for naturalists. Is um, they're always very curious and want to learn more about everything. Um, while there are some naturalists that uh, decide to focus on one particular uh, organism, um, that's when we get into you know biologists and um, ornithologists, which study birds, or entomologists, which study just insects. Naturalists usually are, are, are generalists and really not specialized in one kind of organism. Um, personally, um, I know my birds pretty well. I know my reptiles pretty well, my plants, butterflies. I know nothing of fish. I think I'm going to leave fish and fishing for retirement because it just doesn't all fit in here. I'm going to replace all the work stuff that I learned. I'm going to throw that out and put in fish and stuff underwater. Um, and it's okay not to know everything. Um, it's okay that I know a lot about birds, but I know that I do not know everything about birds. Uh, there's few people that do. Um, so it's always good just to be a student. Um, in our book, there is a um, in our book there is a chapter on historical naturalists, and I do want to kind of focus on that. Uh, I am not going to. Um, I am not going to, um, hold on. My computer wants to restart all of a sudden. I'm going to reschedule this. I'm not going to talk about all the naturalists that are mentioned in the book. I want to focus on the naturalists that, um, basically had an impact here locally, but I do also want to talk about a little bit of history, Texas, and basically talk about how many people over many, many years. Uh, had an interest in nature. Uh, I'm not a historian. Again, I'm just kind of a curious person. Um, you know, for many years, this talk really wasn't, didn't exist. Uh, and I always had a, an interest in Berlandier, who you'll learn about a little bit uh -oh, later. Um, so um, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to focus on a uh, couple things. Again, I'm not a historian. I'm just very interested and wanted to research this and share it with everybody. <clears throat> so we're Texas master naturalists. Let's talk about early Texas. So a lot of people think uh, when they when they think about early Texas, uh, when the Europeans arrived, uh, that Texas didn't really have a lot of people. It was a vast unexplored wilderness. Not true. Um, the first people arrived in Texas uh, 13 to 10,000 years ago. Over the years, many tribes developed over thousands of years all over Texas and pre-European contact, it's thought 
that 150 to 200,000 people were spread across uh, Texas. And in many places, you know, in the evenings, um, when you looked over the horizon, you might just see little smokestacks or little stacks of smoke from all the different people on, along the landscape. So Texas is vast, but people have been all over the tech, all over Texas for many years. On the bottom right, um, thankfully we have um, some evidence that we can look at. So there's some petroglyphs out from uh, near El Paso that um, that are, we're lucky enough that uh, remain intact. <clears throat> Eventually, the Spanish did get here. Um, so in the early 1500s, there was a period of entradas, which were basically short expeditions where the Spanish kind of took their boats along the Gulf of Mexico, parked their boats, and then went in as far as they could. Um, they entered. That's why entradas means to enter. So they, they made many entries into um, areas along the Gulf of Mexico. Whether you, whether you believe it or not, uh, the uh, the map uh, here is the Gulf of Mexico made uh, by um, Alvarez de Pineda. So here, this is from 1519, I guess. This is Florida. Uh, I'm guessing this is Cuba. This is the Yucatan Peninsula, and we're somewhere in here. So it's a very crude map. Um, 1528 is a well-known voyage. During one of those voyages, Mr. Cabeza de Vaca and some of his folks got lost. And uh, because he had some knowledge of, um, you know, some medicinal knowledge, he was allowed to basically travel straight through. He was no threat to uh, Native American peoples, kind of meandered his way, traveled basically through our area at some point made it to Western Mexico, and then made a beeline to civilization in Mexico City. Can y'all see my bright green pointer here on the on the map uh, out on the west side? Okay. Um, so yeah, so <clears throat> from the 1500s to the late 1600s, there really wasn't much interest in exploring um, the vastness of Mexico um, from you know, where the Spanish had their headquarters in Mexico, around Mexico City-ish, until the French started kind of colonizing East Texas, and then Mexico, where the Spanish said, um, well, you know, we can't let the French take over everything. So the Spanish uh, established a variety of missions all over the place. Um, so that's around the time when they established um, the mission San Antonio de Valero mission in 1718 near San Antonio, uh, El Paso over here. Uh, what is it? Number two, three, and four um, around the 1680s. And around this time, well, this is an example of a typical uh, mission. This is what the typical mission is. It's uh, like a large building, like a church, and then a wall where people can kind of live alongside. Um, Along along the wall, lots of uh, history there for sure. Eventually, um, the uh, the Spanish decided to put a colony where we are today. So, 1746, the Spanish province of Nuevo Santander was founded with José de Escandón as a leader, and several towns uh, were founded in that time, like Camargo, Laredo. Mier, Reynosa, um, from its establishment 1746 to 1795, population went from 6,000 to 30,000. I think I have a blow up of the map. Um, here is the artist who drew this. That's his profile picture right there. Um, and you can tell, you know, the Rio Grande Valley, it's not really a valley, it's more of a delta. So you can see all these. Anybody want to guess what these bodies of water are here near the coast? Those estuaries. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of people call them resacas. Um, so you're not wrong by saying estuaries, but um, yeah, if you go by Brownsville, uh, you'll see a lot of resacas around here. This blue ribbon um, 
here it's it's labeled Rio Grande del Norte. Of course, it's had many names, the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, but uh, you can see this blue ribbon right here. If you know where Camargo is, uh, that's across the river from Rio Grande City. This is Camargo. This is Reynosa. So here, eventually McAllen would be over here. Uh, what's really interesting is most of the settlements were created south of the river for whatever reason. Um, so a lot of the big cities were created on the south side of the river. The area north of the river was considered kind of a wasteland. And in this map, they didn't even give it much space. Between here and here, this other blue ribbon, that's the Nueces River. So this is Corpus. So they really didn't give much space to the valley because it was just a, a vast kind of grassland. Um, I will say here, um, anybody want to guess what this big body of water here is? Um, kind of north, north of Reynosa? Maybe about 20 miles from the river, 30 miles. Oh, San del Rey or I'm way off? No, no, you got it exactly right. Whoever said that. Orale. that is the lake. Wow, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's La San del Rey. And uh, if you squint, uh, I can see it on my screen, but um, <clears throat> this is labeled Sal La Salinas. So have you ever heard the last name Salinas? Um, that is basically a salty body of water. Um, so. Um, maybe where the Salinas name came from is from natural salt lakes. Uh, so it's kind of neat. So this was uh, 1740s. If you visit the UTRGV campus in Edinburgh, in the um, southwest corner of the campus, there's a nice statue of Mr. Escandon. And at his feet is a map of the province of Nuevo Santander. And listed is the different towns that were established back then. And how many can how many families who the captain was or the person in charge of it? So uh, I I cut it off in this picture, unfortunately. But here, uh, this Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe de Reynosa, I think, is called, um, was established in 1749. 40 families by Captain Carlos uh, Cantu. So a lot of folks, you know, we think of the valley. It's not much history here. Um, but just on the other side of the of the river and along the river, um, you know, people were in the valley before there was a Texas and before there was a U.S. and before there was a Mexico. Um, people were were kind of uh, establishing a lot of the areas in the valley, and a lot of people don't realize that you know the um, the city of Reynosa and Matamoros and Mier, you know, they're several hundred years old, which is kind of neat. Okay, let's get back to nature. <clears throat> um, sorry, more people stuff. So, um, 1810, the people, native people in Mexico wanted to uprise against the Spanish. So, between 1810 and 1821, lots of stuff, uh, lots of uh, tumult went on. And in 1821, a constitutional monarchy of Mexico was created. And then in 1822, an emperor was named, and then in 1823, a president. Eventually, they kind of figured out what's going on. And in 1827, um, there was a boundary commission established where they wanted, the Mexican government wanted to explore its own boundaries to see what was in the country. Um, so this uh, boundary commission, a lot of scientific exploration went on there too. Um, that wasn't the main goal of the Boundary Commission. It was basically to leave Mexico City, make contact with the Austin colony that was being established in uh, East Texas and kind of basically take inventory of what was in the country, the new country. Um, the leader was uh, a general and a senator, uh, Mieri Teran. Um, he was also a botanist. And then uh, Mexico invited they contacted um, scientists in Geneva and a very famous botanist, um, De Condoli, had one of his gifted students, John Louis Berlandier, uh, travel from Geneva, Switzerland. Is that where Geneva is? Sorry. From Geneva in Europe um, to Mexico City. So Jean Louis Berlandier joined as a botanist and a scientist. Real quick, 
Mieri uh, Teran, he, again, he was a congressman, Mexico City. Uh, he eventually befriended Austin. Um, Mieri Teran was uh, very forward thinking and he was involved a lot in liberating Mexico. Um, one of the reasons why it's thought that he was sent on this uh, boundary commission was because he was too gifted a congressman and too forward thinking. One of his things that he wanted to promote was uh, land rights to native Mexican peoples, um, and uh, which was very forward thinking for the time. But they said, no, nope, you need to get out of here and go on this expedition. Um, <clears throat> of course, joining Ber uh, Tehran uh, was Berlandier. He was born in France, 1805. He studied under this gentleman, De Condoli, who's um, thought of as a major figure in botany uh, through today. Um, he joined as a botanist, zoologist, zoologist, and artist. And you'll see a lot of drawings um, included in here, and those are Berlandier's. This is his drawing of the Cocos people, uh, one of the tribes they encountered. What's really neat is you can still see a lot of the diaries of this Boundary Commission. This was published, I think, 20 or 30 years after the Boundary Commission by Berlandier and this other gentleman. Um, you can find this on Google Scholar. It's in Spanish and French, but uh, it talks about their travels. It's uh, it's not a page turner, okay? It's uh, pretty technical and yeah. Um, this is a little bit more of a page turner. This is a recent book that came out. You can buy this on Amazon that talks about some exploration. And if you can read Spanish, there's a gentleman, an anthropologist from Reynosa who had a great series on Berlandier in uh, this newspaper El Mañana out of uh, Reynosa. Lots of really interesting stuff, not only about Berlandier, but a lot of the native peoples and just things that went on uh, in the 1800s in the valley. So the, the, um, <clears throat> um, the Boundary Commission kind of took off from Mexico City. Their goal was to meet up in East Texas with um, the Austin folks. This is kind of a map from that time-ish. Um, what I want to what I want to show you is down in the valley. Um, you can see the down at the bottom Point Isabel uh, is labeled, and this is a, a a map from a little bit later, probably the 1860s or 80s, but it kind of shows the a lot of the roads that existed back there. The roads are the not the meandering rivers, but the the double lined kind of straight roads. You can see one goes into Mexico and it crosses at Mier um, and then goes to Camargo, Matamoros, and out to the to the coast. Uh, the Boundary Commission visited several places um, back in back in that time. This was around the 1820s. Um, part of their expedition was bear hunting. Um, near San Antonio, uh, hunting for bear and bison at the time. Um, <clears throat> these drawings are Berlandier drawings. Um, so during their travels um, on the Boundary Commission, the general, because he was a general, traveled in a heavy wooden uh, coach that was inlaid with silver. And when they busted a wheel on a, a rock or something, they had to find wood and recreate the wheel fabricate new wheels on the spot. So this gave the folks, the botanists, uh, time to collect uh, specimens along their travels. So um, this map here, you can see Camargo, which is right on the other side of uh, Rio Grande City, um, over here on the right. <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll get to the specimens in a little bit. If you're, if you're ever in Rio Grande City, there's some hiking and biking trails that are owned by the city called the Fortis Trails. And if you go to the southern part of the trails, and if you bushwhack a little bit, you can actually see where the real San Juan meets the real Grand. Uh, it's pretty neat, uh, pretty neat area. Anyway, um, so yeah, so collected a lot of specimens, including um, one of the first specimens to be collected and shared with the general scientific community of Ebony, Texas Ebony. Ebony was very well known to the people in to people in Mexico, to Native Americans at the time. 
but this through Berlandier, who was connected to the existing scientific community back in Geneva, he was able to collect plant parts, uh, press them, uh, cre create plant specimens that he can ship all the way to Europe and describe to, for the scientific community some of these plants for the first time. Um, he talked about the benefits of the plant. And here at the top, when you read a plant book, you'll see the common name, scientific name, the genus, Ebonopsis ebono, and the species name, ebono. And sometimes you'll have in parentheses, the first person to describe that plant. So to this day, um, Texas ebony as B-E-R-L um, assigned to that, to him, because he's the one that basically introduced the ebony to the to science. Um, an aqua was also collected for the first time uh, between Monterey and uh, Camargo. This one was uh, described, collected and described by both Turan, the, the leader of the expedition, and Berlandier. Um, well, like I said several times where um, the general's heavy inlaid, silver inlaid coach would break down. During a stop near the Rio River, they collected black brush, noted as ubiquitous, uh, Texas persimmon, this one has a different name because I think what they collected was probably already described by another naturalist somewhere else where Texas persimmon existed. And uh, this is highly regarded by the native people and known as Chapote. Um, some of these names like Chapote that we still use are, are old, very, very old, sometimes coming from the native peoples themselves. Um, <clears throat> this, this is also a resource you can find. This is Berlandier's actual um, actual diary from his trip. And this is, like I said, not a page turner. There's some cool information in here, but a lot of it is not. Um, as an example, <clears throat> Berlandier kept very, very good notes. Uh, that'll come up later. Um, here uh, on the right side, if it's too small for those in person, it says um, 10 in the morning, um, take off to Bear, B E X A R, which is an old name. Um, at 1017, they got to the road uh, from wherever they camped. Also at 1017, um, there is no water here. Uh, at noon, they got to a place called La Cochina, which is like a dirty place. 1215, uh, they got something to eat. Anyway, you get the picture. It's not a page turner. Um, but uh, but still, it's for folks that study anthropology and history, this is a really detailed, lots of data in here. Uh, more travels <clears throat> in 1828, all over, uh, all over South Texas, into East Texas, Northern Mexico. Um, Part of the expedition and part of the um, information gathered was a lot of uh, befriending and talking to and learning from a lot of native tribes. Um, Berlandier, his art was some of the first art shared with the West, rest of the world about a lot of the native tribes. So this is an example of a person in the Kikapu tribe. Um, on the left of the slide here, you can see some of the other bigger tribes that were encountered. Um, so you can see a lot of those names you might recognize. Uh, other tribes are less well known, and it's thought that in South Texas, there was as many as 80 tribes or more um, that existed in this area. So uh, some of the tribes, Garza's, probably not a Native American name, um, Cocos, Pajaritos, Hanabres, Banguayas, lots of different uh, tribes. But it's really interesting. If north of Mercedes, there's a lake called Lake Campaquas, and Campaquas was the name for one of the local tribes based on how they describe themselves. So a tribe near Mercedes now, really the only remnant of that tribe is a small body of water named after them, Lake Campaquas. Here's um, some Cherokee folks. Um, there was a lot of trading and knowledge trading um, between the a lot of folks back then. You know, you, you think 
um, that the Europeans were always fighting with the native folks, but that kind of wasn't the case until um, people started claiming land as their own and stuff like that. Uh, so there was a lot of bartering, a lot of trading, a lot of gifts, um, you know, and a lot of information sharing. Some of the articles that Berlandier collected are now in the Smithsonian. I'll tell you how a little bit later. But uh, this is kind of an example of the headdress. Um, this, uh, I don't think you can read what this is. I, I blocked it. Would anybody like to guess what this very important tool um, might be that was collected by Berlandier from one of the native folks? It's a tool, it's a hand tool. Okay, I'll tell you. Um, this is a bone scraper or a meat scraper. So if you're collecting meat off of a skin, you use this to kind of take that skin off um, the, uh, the, the hide or the bones and stuff. What's really interesting is the origin here is New Mexico. It's a Comanche uh, artifact but it was collected in the middle of Texas, basically, by Berlandier. Uh, so, um, yeah, you can kind of see that people did get around back in the day. Um, any anyway, guesses on what this might be? Uh, this was something that might be carried in a Native American's bag, pretty important um, part of everyday life for a Native American. Oh man, Marie Montalvo. Man, it's a really good guess. Man, how did you know that? <laughs> so, Marie Montalvo guessed Firestarter. And um, yeah, that's exactly what it is. This is a dried fungus used for tinder. So, when you're making fire, you use tinder to start the fire and then kindling to like, you know, small sticks to, to make it bigger. Um, but yeah, this is a dried fungus. Um, that was carried, you know, you get fungus, it's really dry, keep it in your pocket, and it helps you start a fire. Good guess. Um, so, a little bit more, more travels in 1829, uh, more specimens being collected. Here's some of the crisscrossing that they did. They did eventually uh, make it to uh, Port Isabel. Um, Ritama, which is uh, noted as widespread, um, mimosa, giant mimosa, um, mimosa pigro. This ended up being named after Berlandier. Um, this one's kind of neat. If you know anything, or if you know your plants, some of these mimosas are are called sensitive briar or sensitive bush because when you touch it, the leaves kind of close slowly. And um, apparently, the a lot of the expedition was spooked because when they rubbed up against this, they noticed that the plants were closing. And it spooked the people and the horses got spooked. So everybody was kind of, you know, freaked out because of this plant, which is kind of funny. But um, but yeah, this is uh, one of the one of the specimens collected, first collected in shared with science. Um during the uh, travels, um a lot of the uh, a lot of the accounts and a lot of the uh, Diaries mentioned protecting the skins as they crossed rivers. Um, does it, anybody want to guess what uh, what this donkey is, um, or what what the the purpose of those big bags on the donkey are? Is so it's protect the skins. Oh man, man, you guys are sharp. Yes. So this is, um, of course, this isn't from the 1820s, but uh, this was a traditional way for a long time of carrying water um, on long trips. So this is a, a 1800s tanker truck uh, back then. Um, so what they would do, they would get a sheep or a goat uh, and they would skin it, tie, tie uh, the legs off right here, kind of seal it, seal off the, the, these legs up here and then the neck, I'm sorry this is gross, but it's kind of cool at the same time. The neck, uh, they would just kind of close it with a string and they would fill it with water. So when it was time to drink, you just undo the string at the neck and put a ladle in and that's how you distributed water. 
So if you can imagine, there's, yeah, well, yeah, Blanca says, poor goats. If you can imagine traveling many, many miles, you know, not a lot of fresh water between, you know, between places, you know, very few places to get water and then crossing South Texas, which is full of thorns and being very careful not to rip your only source of water. Um, I ask for it every year. I've been doing this presentation for about five or six years. If anybody gives me one of these for my birthday or Christmas, I'll be so happy. Like it's like a camel pack, you know, for hiking. You just have a goat skin in the back full of water. Anyway, one of these days. And this is an old post postcard. Uh, this person was carrying around pulque, which is like a, I think an alcoholic beverage. It's pretty neat. Okay, eventually Berlandia parted ways with the Boundary Commission. He ended up traveling a little bit more, but finally he ended up settling um, in Matamoros where he basically made his, his living as like a pharmacist, as an apothecary. So he would collect uh, native or natural medicines and, and he was kind of a healer. Um, so one of the reasons why he probably parted ways is when he shipped, I think he shipped, I don't know, thousands of specimens back to uh, Switzerland. And unfortunately, the condition of those specimens was terrible. His mentor said he was a terrible scientist and maybe that's why he, Berlandier never returned to Europe. Uh, he was a French man who knew Spanish and a little bit of English, and he just decided to stay in Matamoros. Um, <clears throat> while in Matamoros, he kept on collecting all kinds of data about everything that he could. Um, here's his drawing of some of the local birds. Kind of neat that he drew Canada goose. Because now if you're a birder, Canada goose is not a common bird down here. Maybe it was back then. The middle is a speckled belly goose or a greater white fronted goose and then a great egret. Um, other than animals and plants, he collected information on weather, astronomy, sound. Um, and this is for, he would, he would collect daily temperature readings um, 10 feet below the ground at ground level and 10 feet above the, above the ground every single day. Why? I don't know. He just collected all this data. Um, here's a nice drawing of a red eared slider from the 1800s. Um, he also made a lot of maps of the area. <clears throat> uh, the Rio Grande River is here. So here are some of the rivers uh, south of the border. Uh, one of the things that he had lots of notes on, uh, and I still haven't found them, one of these days I will, uh, is um, he would travel to Green Island which is here or here, one of these, but he would travel to Green Island, which is a place that still exists today. It's a bird sanctuary, and he would make notes about what was there uh, from back in the 1830s and 40s. Here again is the Las Salinas, which are salt lakes, and then all the different towns. And he had some pretty, oh, yeah, so here's a more detailed, uh, detailed map. Las Salinas, Reynosa, Mier Camargo, all that stuff. Uh, this is uh, a lot of the little ranches between Matamoros and Reynosa, as you can see again, mostly on the south side. Uh, detail map of Reynosa. I just haven't had the time to see where this is in Reynosa, but uh, this is Reynosa back in the day. Um, very little known about his personal life. He did marry and have several children from what I've but from what I know, uh, his most of his children did not stay in Matamoros. Several of them kind of went into the United States and just kind of got lack, uh, got lost to history. Um, later in life, Berlandier, since he knew French, English, and Spanish, I'm going to blaze through this a little bit. Um, he did have some involvement in the Mexican-American War. Um, since he knew a little bit of English, he was asked to present. General Zachary Taylor with a letter not to cross the Oro Colorado because that would be considered an act of war. And the next morning, Taylor did just that. And eventually, Mexico, Mexico and the US joined uh, or battled at the Battle of Palo Alto. And Berlandier was a field surgeon on the Mexican army. And he also drew maps of the battle, which is pretty neat. Um, <clears throat> another 
one of his maps on the right. At some point, he might have been uh, mayor of, um, of Matamoros. It's really not known. Continue to collect data. He was arrested because if you're in politics, you're probably going to get arrested at some point. And then in 1851, Berlandier uh, passed away crossing a swollen river. What's really unfortunate is nobody knows what Berlandier looked like. A couple of years ago, uh, there was a Berlandier article published and they had a picture of a random guy. I contacted the author because I was excited that it might be a picture of Berlandier, uh, but it wasn't. He just put a random 1800s guy in the article. Um, so, yeah, so we don't know what Berlandier looks like. We can only know him from his artwork. What's really interesting, uh, during the Mexican-American War, there was a lot of naturalists that came um, to South Texas on the U.S. side that were really impressed with South Texas because it's an area that was really not explored too much by science in the day. Uh, one of the people that came down was this gentleman. Uh, Darius Couch. So he was stationed, um, you know, down here. <clears throat> Eventually, he was. He spent some time at Fort Brown, and um, took many notes about the different kinds of birds and stuff while he was down here. And after the Mexican American War, he contacted the Smithsonian and asked for some money to create a scientific expedition to the Rio Grande Valley to collect. Uh, scientific data. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't a great collector. He couldn't catch many things and he hired helpers. And one of the helpers he hired from Mexico, from Matamoros, told him, hey, well, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, my old boss uh, was this French guy who collected for 20 years. And so the helper that Darius Couch hired just happened to be a longtime worker for Berlandier before he passed away. And just two years before, so uh, the assistant put couch in contact with Berlandier's uh, widow and what he found was 24 years of data related to mammals, insects, fish, Matamoros uh, for um, $500. He bought a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, collection and that collection. Most of it went to the Smithsonian, but uh, couch bought some of the collection with his own money. And this is how we know of all these collections and all these paintings and all this data from the 1830s in the US. I mean, the, in, uh, in South Texas. Uh, so really, Couch, he couldn't collect too many things, but what he really did find was a huge collection of data collected over 20 years. Um, Couch did catch a few things. Um, he was the first person to describe the Couch's Kingbird that was collected near the mouth of the river. And he also collected um, and described Couch's Spadefoot Toad. Um, so if you see a Couch's Kingbird on a wire, now you know what uh, Darius Couch looked like. Uh, something really fun that I'll mention, uh, Couch, <clears throat> um, he really couldn't travel into Mexico because there was a lot of unrest at the time. He returned to Massachusetts and he was technically still in the army this whole time. He was just kind of like on a leave of absence and he ended up being in several uh, civil war battles, including these here. Uh, and he was at Gettysburg. So this picture was taken uh, just after uh, Abraham Lincoln gave his famous Gettysburg address and it's thought. So here's couch and. Lincoln is on the right, and it's thought that Couch is this gentleman right here. So he might have been sitting immediately to the right of Abraham Lincoln when Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address. So when we see a Couch's Kingbird on the wire, like we're all famous because like we're close to Abraham Lincoln in a way. That's what I think. Um, <clears throat> so the collection, like I said, it was huge. Uh, 2,000 boxes, 150 glass bottles filled with specimens, notes, maps. Smithsonian could only pay for some of the collection. Couch got that the rest of the collection and sold it to Yale, Princeton, and a lot of other people. Um, eventually, the scientists of that time um, used that collection for many, many years to help describe 
our South Texas species. Um, so this is a, a book, Everything Known About Birds. Um, this was published in 1905 uh, by these folks. And in it, there's, um, again, a description for the scientific community of this wren and Couch uh, was the one that wrote about it, which is pretty neat. I think eventually there is no Berlandier wren today. I think it was lumped or split with some other wrens. Um, cool book. You can find it on Google Scholar for free online. A lot of it, it's just interesting um, that 100 years ago, people had such an interest in birds. Um, a lot of the stuff is outdated, but pretty cool. So again, Couch, Biggest contribution was bringing the, the Berlandier collection to light. And as I said, a lot of different scientists from a lot of different um, areas of study use Couch's collection, sorry, Ber Berlandier's collection to um, basically introduce new animals to science. And when a scientist use, uses, or when he describes a new, he or she describes a new species, they get to choose what the scientific name is going to be. So a lot of scientists named on many plants after Berlandier, which is one of the reasons I like to talk about them. So our real grandy leopard frog, scientific name is Rana Berlandieri. Um, Texas tortoise, tortoise is Gophers Berlandieri. Mexican badger, there's a subspecies uh, called Taxidae Texas Berlandieri. And then a whole bunch of plants that were, collect that were used or described from his specimens. Uh, you can go today. Oh, well, what I mentioned earlier about, about Berlandier being sloppy, he uh, sent 25,000 specimens from South Texas and Mexico to Switzerland, and he was called sloppy because they weren't great. Um, however, this stuff is good enough for Harvard and the Smithsonian, so who knows what that guy in Switzerland was talking about. Uh, this is an example of one of his specimens. This is Gachnadia hypoluca, which is Chamonke, and this is a uh, genuine Berlandier collection, um, Berlandier pressing from the 1800s that is uh, part of the um, Harvard herbarium. And what's really neat is you can go online and actually find a lot of these. Um, it's pretty cool. And like I said, um, what we know about Berlandier uh, is through his drawings. So um, I think, again, um, you know, I'm not covering a lot during this uh, talk, but it is neat that a lot of this stuff is out there. And just like us today, 200 years later, you know, there's a lot of folks that are very curious in nature and want to want to learn more. So what we're doing today, um, we're kind of, continuing on this very long tradition of being interested in the planet. A uh, couple of cool things. Uh, if you all have ever heard of cochineo, it's a small insect that you find on um, on a prickly pear cactus to make red dye. And this is a vial of cochineal powder from back then. Pretty neat. Um, oh, very cool. And um, yeah, this is a a jar from in 1841 from Mexico, blue catfish. And um, yeah, there's a lot of lot of stuff, not too much stuff, but if you wanted, if you're interested in history and interested in this kind of stuff, there are lots of neat, um, neat information. I am at my time. This we can save for another day or maybe some study. Um, this gentleman is not in your book. Robert Runyon, write his name down, and if you want, you can look at his 15,000 photographs in an online collection by UT. This gentleman spent uh, most of his life in Brownsville, and he was a big photographer um, and local botanist, and he has many plants named after him as well. Um, I'm going to, okay, I'm just going to go through these. These are pictures by Runyon, coastal flooding, flooding in Brownsville, 1918 some big fish from back in the day. Um, he took this picture of Pancho Villa being captured. Um, that's General Pershing on the left and the Mexican general on the right, Pancho Villa in the middle. Uh, this is not an ocelot, it's a bobcat. Um, and this is La Salle del Rey from 
the 1920s. As always, that's a great presentation, Javier. I learned sure. some, I learned something every time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I try to change it. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, and again, there's uh, lots to learn. Uh, I hope you all the best for your classes. And um, yeah, um, you guys uh, take care. Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. So you got a chance to listen or hear from Javier De Leon, who's one of our advisors. He represents Texas Parks and Wildlife. Tony Reisinger is our other advisor who represents Texas AgriLife and Sea Grant. And both of our advisors have won Advisor of the Year through the tech, to our TMN program. They're excellent advisors. They're, they really know their stuff. Ever get a chance to talk to Tony, ask him about the Bahia Grande, the shrimping industry, all the stuff that he gets to work on. And, and he is so willing to share with the rest of us what he's experienced and what he has seen. And so it's a pleasure to have Tony as, as our advisor and it's a pleasure to have him speak to, to, for us tonight. So I'll hand it over to Tony. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. I've been in Cameron County for 42 years now. <laughs> I've seen a lot of things happen, and I'm going to go over what makes the Rio Grande Valley. I lost the word unique in there somewhere. I don't know why, because I typed it out, but it disappeared. But I think y'all can understand what I'm going to talk about. And it's not just marine things. I've a marine, I'm a marine biologist by training, and now I'm a county marine extension agent. and. I went to the University of Texas at Brownsville for my master's degree. So what makes it unique? One thing that we have is ecosystem diversity. Um, we have various ecosystems. One example is one ecosystem that washes up on our shore. Does anybody know what that is? No? What? Weed? Trash, yeah, trash can be, but no, sargassum weed. Sargassum has its own ecosystem. All the things that are in it actually mimic it, all the things that live amongst it. And then the Gulf of Mexico, we, we're on the Gulf of Mexico and it's so diverse. Uh, we've got, I guess we just recently had a talk here on some of the deep water corals that are out there, our beaches. I could give you, I could show you a, um, a graph or a, a drawing of a cross section of a beach, but most of y'all can just imagine it in your minds where you have the waves breaking on the shore. Then you have the fore beach and the back beach. That's where fore beach is where the sand piles up because it moves down the beach with the longshore current. Then it piles up onto the back beach and then blows in inland. And if it hits an obstruction, it makes a sand dune. And then sand dunes move across the land. And that's, that's one reason that we have the sand sheet that's between here and Corpus Christi. Does everybody know what the, the sand sheet? Scientific name, I think, is the Aeolian Plain, which means sand sheet, I believe. <laughs> So how do you think that sand got onto the King Ranch? Wind? Actually, in... What? How did the King Ranch get onto the sand? Yeah, how did the King Ranch get onto the sand? The reason, excuse me, I went back on that. The reason we have that is because we have two longshore currents along the Texas coast. When you swim off of South Padre Island, most of the time, say in the summertime, you move to the north with the current. If you go off Corpus Christi, guess which direction you usually will move? To the south. So what happens when those two currents collide? It's carrying sand, so they drop out because sediment drops out when you don't have any current, it settles. And that's how all that sand ended up on the Aeolian Plain, because we have two currents that collide off of there. Enough about beaches. Texas State Parks, um, we, have, we have, let's see, three Texas State Parks, I think, here in the valley. If you haven't been to them, um, I, I think Santa Ana 
as the most birds, right? I'm, I'm a closet birder. I don't know that much, but one of these days I, I've got some glasses and I'm going to go out there. I actually know fish better than anything. And shrimp. Wetland restoration. I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit, but we had one of the largest West wetland restoration projects ever in the United States, around 10,000 acres. Mari was part of that. She, she participated in that. We have wildlife refuges, and our wildlife ref refuges have, are extremely important to the valley because they've connected along the border most of the areas that they could get it, via acquisition, and they're still acquiring those properties. And so they have, they've been trying to establish a wildlife corridor along the valley so that wildlife can move and spread out here. Ocelots depend. On, on proper habitat. So that's good that, that that's happening. And we're learning more and more about the endangered ocelots. I had a uh, friend that was a shrimp farmer here in the valley, and he was wondering why we were trying to reestablish the ocelots because he said he had three of them as pets in Central America. And he said, they're great pets. And I, I was shocked. <laughs> so I mentioned that land, Land acquisition for conservation is big down here. Laguna Atascosa has been growing pretty much annually. And we are also a migratory bird corridor that handles, I think, is it two or three different flyways that converge here. What do we have here that we're concerned about because the migrating birds are coming through? Does anybody have any idea? Windmills, yeah. We're or concerned that there's no water. Pardon me? The concerns that there's no water, and if there's no water, there's no life? There is. I mean, if there's, if there's not water, there is not life, yes. But for, cons for conservation, is that what you're talking What is you? I misunderstood. Okay, okay. So wind generators are what we're, we're concerned about. We don't really know how much or how, what effect they have on our bird populations. They're studied, but it's very difficult to get that information out. And lately, outside of Port Isabel, I've seen some of these wind generators leaking oil. Have, has anybody seen that on 510? And I'm wondering what's going on there. Who's watching? Who's watching that? Who's looking after that property? I know the man, Ruben Barrera. I knew him because he's passed away, but his name was Ruben Barrera, and he kept it in pristine shape. And I'm I'm concerned about that. Uh huh. I had a friend that was driving driving to go deer hunting. And he's driving along, and all of a sudden, his windshield got completely covered. He couldn't figure out what it was. And he went out and touched it. And it was oil that was slinging off of one of those. So I'm, I'm concerned about it. And it's one of our jobs to be sure that our environment stays healthy. We as master naturalists. But you got to be careful. There's a fine line there on, on what we do. And, it's, it's very difficult for many of us. Talking about, about our species, migratory bird corridor, but we have numerous species of butterflies and birds. I think Javier over at the Nature Center just reached his 500th bird. I don't think I've seen probably half of that as far as species, and that, that's just amazing to me. And then finally, the hypersaline Laguna Madre. It's only one of six hypersaline, which means saltier than the ocean. So there it has, it's one of six in the world, worldwide. And so that's amazing. And it has a huge carpet of seagrasses that are in trouble because they've been declining year after year. But it does still produce a lot of fish but not as much as it used to before we started developing. And that's, that's another thing we need to keep an eye on. 
The Rio Grande. The Rio Grande divides our two nations, and we were once part of Mexico. And we have quite a friendship and, and relatives on the other side. And it's important that both countries pay attention to the river. Mexico is, is cleaning up their effluence that they're putting in, so are we. But most of, most of the drainage here in the Rio Grande Valley goes into the Arroyo Colorado, and I'll go get to that in a minute. The Rio Grande did have a problem with water, uh, with water weeds. Hydrilla, I think that, that's, well, I'm not sure if that's hydrilla or not, but it was cleaned out by a storm that we had several years, I think in 2010 it washed all of those uh, plants out of the Rio Grande. But they'll come back because even when you clean up sewage, you're still left with nutrients. Rolando? Is that an uh, exotic plant? Yes. Okay. It's still there. I don't think that's a very it's still there? I don't think it's, I can't remember. Yeah. And it tends to clog up the, slow down the river. Of course, the river doesn't have much flow because we use most of the water in the Rio Grande for what? Agriculture. I think 80% of the water in the Rio Grande is used for agriculture. And agriculture is important. It's, it produces, I think, it's probably second to recreational tourism here in the valley. So why would I have the Nile Delta up here? Anybody got any idea? What? Because we're a Delta. Because we're a Delta and we are an arcuate delta. I turned our delta to the north, facing north, so we could compare it to the Nile Delta. And the Nile has similar water outlets. I can point with this and see. Can everybody see that? Like our Rosacas. And it is shaped in an arc and it it has uh, barrier islands around it. It's very similar to our area. Does it? Does not. I, I've even checked on that. <laughs> a lot of water comes down it, but a lot of water there is used for agriculture, just like, just like it is here in the Rio Grande Valley. Let's see. Oh, you can, let me go back. And you can see the agriculture, you can see the, the footprint of agriculture here, and you can see the cities. The cities are really growing so much. What I thought interesting was Matamoros and Reynosa show up differently than our cities, and I don't know why. Is that what it is? Yeah. All concrete. So Rolando answered. I don't. Can everybody hear what he's saying? Online, he said that it's the amount of concrete that is in the cities that are south of us because they show up as a much lighter color. So. The Rio Grande is the fourth longest river in North America. It uh, has much less discharge than the Nile does, and it originates in Colorado, and we have much less pre precipitation in the headwaters up there. Our major tri tributaries are the Pecos, the Rio Conchos, and the Rio San Juan. And we have major dams, Elephant Butte, Amistad, and Falcon. Falcon is pretty much where the Rio Grande Valley is defined to begin. It's not really a valley. Everybody probably knows that. It was just named that to attract people here because everyone wants to see a beautiful green valley. <laughs> and it worked. We're here. And one other thing is dams do interrupt the natural flow of water. 
the Rio Grande would flood almost annually and fertilize this area. If you ever have been on the side of a Rosaka, which are the outlets for the river when it flooded or when it changed course, the banks along the side of the river are much higher because of silt deposition. And that silt tends to make our, our uh, farming areas more productive. If you live on it, does anyone live on a Rosaka here? You can grow plants a lot better because it's very fertile, right? I live in Port Isabel and I have a hard time growing things. Yes. Much less discharge. It's a smaller river and it is also, I guess it the Nile is huge, but it has a similar, a similar delta. But the Rio Grande is a lot smaller river as far as width now because it's, it has all those dams. I think they have one large dam on the Nile, the Aswan is it? And, and they, they had a hard time building that because that river is so, so um, amazing. <laughs> but it's also comparing like the southeast, the rivers are so much bigger. Yeah, yeah, but we've got the Missouri River that comes out and that goes into the Mississippi. But that's a big river too. But you're right, I guess. We don't, well, you've got in Oregon. Okay, yeah, Southwest, that's because we're dry we're, and we're subject to droughts quite often, probably more so than, than most places. So the looking at both deltas, um, they're geologically young i think the nile is seven around seven thousand and that's in at the present because when when the sea level changes the delta moves like if sea level goes down the delta moves offshore and if you look at underwater charts of the rio grande you can see that that arc shape goes way out there and the river probably emptied into the Gulf of Mexico, or did empty into the Gulf of Mexico, about 50 miles offshore. So we have very young deltas, 7,000 for the Nile and around 10 to 12, I think, for the Rio Grande, which is really interesting. We're just, we're, we're young compared to geologic time. Both are subsiding. Why would they be subsiding? That means they're they're that means they're not yeah the sediments do not renourish this area so we're sinking very slowly and if we're extracting minerals from underneath us that I guess exacerbates the I guess the drop in the in the height of the land and it's dominated I I missed that but. That's a hydrologic system. Does everybody know what that is? That's where water evaporates, say off the ocean, goes into clouds, move out, moves over the land, and it rains, and then the water comes back down the rivers, and that's the hydrologic cycle. This is a look at the Nile at night. And so one of the problems, and if you look at the Rio Grande Valley at night, it's growing, the population's growing and a lot more lights come on. So we're losing agricultural land. And sooner or later, we're not gonna be as, well, we are not as productive as we have in the past. So that's one of the situations that, that we are experiencing in both areas. They're called exotic rivers because they're, they're different. They're long, they're very long rivers. And they, the origins of most exotic rivers are, originate in areas that have high precipitation. The Rio Grande originates in the Rocky Mountains and there's a lot of precipitation up there, but going down the river, you just don't see it. it moves into a much drier land. And they, like I mentioned earlier, they flow through, both of them 
flow through hot, arid regions with high evaporation rates. And most of the flow from the source area does reach distributaries. Our distributaries are not really used that much anymore except for moving water out of the river to supply the cities. And, or I guess, yeah, that's about it. And it also, I think Laguna Tascosa depends on one of those, uh, one of the Rosacas to supply water to them. This is a geologic map that I thought was really interesting and I have a hard time re reading it, but you can see what they call alluvial soils here in the southern tip of Texas. If do y'all see, do I have to point with this on the screen? Okay, see the alluvial soils there? That means that, that all, most of that soil originated via flooding. Uh, Dr. Jean Paul who gave me some of these, let me go back. Who gave me some of, or gave me some pictures that are for this presentation, said that um, that it's really unique in this one area that we have that very dark area. That is a an area that they have that there was ash deposition in, and it was like. 34 million years ago. I'll get to that in, in a minute, but um, extremely interesting geology for us. You know, we're in a flat coastal area, but when you move up the valley, it changes quite a bit. This is an interesting uh, picture of that from the 1800s during the Mexican-American War. I think it was 18, around 1846. Uh, yeah, it was 1846 when it was taken, but you can see U.S. troops looking at Matamoros, and then also there's a gunboat in the picture. One of those is a gunboat, and it says the name of it. Can anybody read that? I, I did know the name of the gunboat earlier. It's a Mexican gunboat Chinaco. And that's it, cruising by. The military were the first people to start cruising up the Rio Grande in steamboats. They bought 42 of them during the Mexican-American War to transport supplies up the river. And as late as, I think it's the 1980s, there was a, the wreckage of a gunboat around the Brownsville area. I ran across a picture of that a while back. One thing I guess that master naturalists need to take into consideration is history, because we have had such an impact on nature. If you don't know the history, you're not gonna be able to realize what has been happening all these years. And I love reading, reading the history of the Rio Grande Valley, it's rich. Here are some of uh, the Rosacas. I think this was published early on by Dr. Zavaleta, who was at uh, University of Texas Brownsville and UTRGV. I think he's, he's still there. And he just, just plotted some of the uh, Rosacas that were once either a tributary of the Rio Grande or distributary of the Rio Grande or the actual path that the Rio Grande took. The, it's, it's arguable as to which is the furthest north of the, of the Rosacas, whether it was Los Fresnos or Rosaca de los Cuates. We don't really know. And then further south in Mexico, they've covered up most of their Rosacas because, for agriculture. And it's... Because that is not really considered a Rosaca. That is used for overflow, for flooding. It was, it, it pretty much was, was a relief valve for the river during floods. It's a natural, natural thing, but it's cut off now. And it is used as a relief valve, but it's controlled. In fact, 
in during Hurricane Beulah, the control structure failed and the Arroyo Colorado flooded. So one of the I, things I think is unique is Brazos-Santiago Pass. Does anybody know why it was called Brazos-Santiago? Which translated means the arms of St. James. St. James was the patron, is the patron saint of Spain. And when, I think it was Pineda that, that sailed into this and they were out in the Gulf of Mexico. And I don't know if you've ever been offshore in the Gulf, but it can get extremely rough. And they got in here and they felt like they were welcomed <laughs> into Braz the arms of St. James. So they named it that, which is really unique. And it's the only natural outlet or inlet into the lower Laguna Madre. And this is, uh, they had, this was, I think, during one of the storms, they actually surfed on the inside of it. I believe there may have been a red tide at that time too. And I think they were saying, surf till you barf. <laughs> but that's a shrimp boat in the background. And I'm, I'm not even gonna go into the shrimping industry because they're struggling so much right now. The port of Brownsville was completed in 1936, I think. And I, I know a guy whose father was working on a dredge that was dredging and removing the soil and piling it up on either side. And they said the tarpon and all the fish were following the dredge in. I don't know why, but this is just an interesting story that I've heard. If you talk to people that have lived here a long time, you tend to learn things that you've never even thought about. And I never, I didn't think fish would follow a dredge. I thought they'd swim away from it. So because we built the channel and built the highway 48 next to the channel, we cut off, we cut off the water going into these lagoons and they dried out and created a humongous dust problem until 2006, I think it was, that they opened Bahia Grande. And Cameron County is the, are, are the ones that started that. They got a grant back in 1982 to begin making Bahia Grande, or flooding, wanting to, or they wanted to flood Bahia Grande. They had to dig a channel here from the ship channel into the Bahia Grande so that it would flood. And they, they looked at all different scenarios. They wanted to bring water in from San Martin Lake. And I think maybe on this side, I'm not sure, but they had a lot of different plans and it took a long time, right, Marty? It took quite a long time. And when it finally happened, the dust problem alleviated. During the years in between when it, when it dried out and was flooded, occasionally it would get water into it and fish would go in there and they would, they would start, they would grow up, but then it would evaporate out and we would lose them. This is what, this is one of the, uh, a chart that my son worked on when he was going to the University of Texas at Brownsville. He's now got his doctorate and uh, is in Maryland. I'm proud of him. <laughs> so he did this for Dr. Jude Benavides, who will be one of your speakers. He'll, he'll probably show you this because I think he shows it during every one of his presentations. It's an amazing chart. And you can see what happened to the wetlands that were there. I heard from an old timer that schooners would come up in and almost, I think, go all the way to Brownsville at one time. And I never, I've only had one person tell me that, but that's interesting because we had schooners, shallow water draft schooners called Laguna Madre Scows that were a sloop, I believe. And they had big sails, but they didn't draw much water and they could sail in, in that uh, shallow water. But they also fished in the Laguna Madre for redfish 
One old timer told me a story that his father, in fact, his father was the mayor of Port Isabel one time. He, uh, Charles Burnell, who's, who just celebrated his 90th birthday. Well, his father was uh, a fish buyer and he had some of the Laguna Madre scows bring him some fish and they brought him, he's, they said, we can catch a lot of fish. Will you buy them? He said, yeah, I'll give you a nickel a pound. They brought in 10,000 pounds of fish. He was amazed. And then he said, they said, can we get some more? He said, go ahead, do it. I don't think you're going to catch it. Well, they did. They caught 10,000 more and he didn't have any room for those. So uh, that was interesting because they would surround a school of redfish. There were huge schools in Laguna Madre. The Laguna Madre supported a lot more fish at that time than it does now. And they think that our production has declined because of all the filling of wetlands that, are, that has occurred. Question. Yes. So, uh, this frame or one or two back showed that gumbo yes. steaming upstream. So, can you point out where they entered the delta from the uh, Gulf side? That's right there. That's right there. The and there was a place called Baghdad right here. That was a like Sin City on the Rio Grande. Big, big ocean going vessels would have to go to the Bronx Suburb of Bath. They would go on the shallow draft. Yeah, but the, the steamboats, they were shallow water draft too because they would get stuck on sandbars all the time in the Rio Grande. They couldn't go up very far, but they went, I forget. Um, Camargo, is that? Laredo. Probably in the 30s, I think, maybe. I know you got to look when, when um, I guess, parks and wildlife, when wildlife and fishery, it was wildlife and fisheries at first, and I don't know the exact dates, but parks are celebrating 100 years, so... Wildlife and fisheries was before that. And my math isn't good, so. Right now, we probably catch more sport fishing in the Laguna Madre than they probably did because there's so many people that fish. I'm, I'm worried, I think that, well, they now they have closures for fishing for flounder and because you can't, like December, I think, December, you can't catch flounder at all in Laguna Madre. So what was there? Another question? Yes. No, just come in. There's still a historic house near Santa Maria. Yes, yeah. Really interesting stuff. Like small boats, and, and they were fast, and... and I've got a good friend, his grandfather or great-grandfather, he lives in Palm Valley. Robert Dalzell is his name. And his family were steamboat captains and they married into the, uh, the family that owns the King Ranch many years ago. Interesting stuff. I like talking to old timers and I'm getting old myself. So. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get through all this. I've got 10 more minutes. I like to talk. So this is just a look at Bahia Grande two different times when it had water in it and when it didn't. And with a southeast wind, the, any citrus groves or people that lived up there, citrus groves had trouble and people had respiratory problems because of all the dust that blew out of it. And many of you probably know that we have these, these clay sand dunes in this area, and they're called what? Lomas, which means hill in Spanish. And those lomas are actually just sand dunes made from clay. And the clay was once the Rocky Mountains, and it broke down the rocks, and, and, and it formed, and it came all the way down the river and turned into clay, and then Clay is very light, and so the southeast winds built 
those clay dunes there, and they're great habitat for cats primarily. And what cats are out there? Ocelots, bobcats, and one other one, jaggerundis. I think I saw a jaggerundi once. And I'm a biologist, and I told people that they didn't believe me. And I had a witness with me when we saw it, and it was south of the, of the ship channel. That's another story. This is what Bahia Grande looked like after a rainstorm, a big rainstorm. It was starting to dry out again. Oops. Starting to dry out. You see the dust blowing off of it? And they've changed all this. It's, it looks a lot better now. That we have a 200-foot wide channel, right, Marty? Wow. So when it does dry out, I mentioned to you that the fish grow up in there and it becomes hypersaline, they die. And we, I think we estimated several, I don't know, 100,000 fish. This was before 2006, before we reflooded it. And those are primarily red drum or red fish. And UTB and U University of Texas Brownsville and University of Texas Rio Grande Valley started sampling and they've continued it till this day. And it's great because they've got some amazing scientific information. The ecological value of Bahia Grande, because now it has something like 3,000 acres of seagrasses in it, which it's unbelievable. It has oysters also. The ecological value exceeds $200 million annually. That just, that, that's a mind-blowing figure. That means it just, it has huge production. These are some of the little fish that we started picking up. I think those are fundalists on top and bottom. I can't remember that one. That was a, this is a triple tail, which is, Really unique. That was one of the little fish that moved into the area after it was flooded. We caught several of these gill netting. I mentioned the Arroyo Colorado earlier. It's a 90 mile river, or I guess I would, we call it a Yazoo stream. A Yazoo stream is one that relieves another. There's a Yazoo River next to the Mississippi. I think it's in Mississippi. And so when the Mississippi used to flood, the Yazoo was a relief valve for it. And so that's what the Arroyo served until, until it was cut off and the river's, river was also dammed. Those are white pelicans there. The Arroyo is beautiful. This is just outside of Harlingen going up it, but it's got high bacteria loads. We've been trying to clean it up for years, but as our population grows, we have more and more effluent going into it. So keeping up, we, in 2007, we came up with a plan to treat and to treat anything that was going into it. And it didn't, it didn't last long. So it's, it's a tough situation there. And I don't know how I got there. Did I? Was I pushing out oh, there? So we do, I mentioned Texas State Parks earlier and we do have three of them. Benson, Estero, and Rosaca Day. Where's Santa Ana though? That's, is it Santa Ana? Yeah. Okay. There's also some that the Oh yeah, and I heard today that Elon Musk offered to buy 400 acres there, and he's going to trade it for land between or north of west of Port Isabel. Okay, I, think, I think the state park right there by the broad side is only 47. And it's, 47? Yeah, it's 400 acres that he wants to Oh, 400 that he's going to. Okay. So Rolando said it's 40 acres that Musk is wanting to buy or trade yeah. for 400 acres, 10 to one. <laughs> Don't we live in an interesting world? <laughs> the what?
So what, what Robin just said for all of you, for all of you that, that couldn't hear, Robin said that the function or the, I guess the biological function of that 40 something acres out there near Boca Chica probably exceed that, the, the biological production of that 400 acres that they want to trade. We don't know yet. <laughs> That Rolando said that that 47 acre is prime bird habitat. For the one endangered species. Piping plover is for piping plover and red knots also frequent Boca Chica Beach. So these, I, I mentioned the, um, the wildlife corridor and you can see where Fish and Wildlife purchased a lot of property along the river so that these animals could move through and have habitat to live in along the border because in Mexico you just don't don't see it like that unless you go further south. Sabal Palm Sanctuary. I love this spot. It's on the river and it's got it has the rab house. Does anybody know the name what snake this is? A what? Speckled racer. Yes. I, I couldn't figure out what it was because I'm a fish person. Yeah, I think Seth Patterson took this, this yeah. picture. He was one of the, I guess, he even took pictures for Sea Grant for us for a while. So we've got a lot of good, good shots. This is the Rab House. It was a plantation house. And now it's our headquarters for the Gorgas Science Foundation. I'm on the board of directors for it. We've got a meeting tomorrow night. <laughs> I got to remember to do I had it tonight and I went, no, I can't be. I've got to give a talk. So I looked and it's okay. And that bird is similar to a woodpecker that's on the Sabal palm. Nobody knows what it is. Oh. <laughs> and this is an aerial view of it. That's a Rio Grande in the uh, upper right hand. Uh, portion of, of this, and I got this picture from Gorgas, and they planted a, a lot of palm trees. The, the palm forest on, along the Rio Grande covered thousands of acres when the Spaniards came in, but they were all cleared, and palms were used for, for posts that, that you used to construct docks with, islands. And they lasted a long time. So that's one of the reasons. But it also, they just cleared it for agriculture. But they left some, and Audubon picked it up. And the Gorgas Science Foundation, we lease it from Audubon, I think probably for a dollar a year, something like that. You want to build a disclosure argument? Yeah. It was the rap plantation which introduced uh, irrigation, taking water from the river for that, which, which devastated the palm for it. For their, their okay, Rolando says that, that the Rab Plantation introduced irrigation this which is, to, the, to Cameron County. Well, they, they demonstrated it for the whole valley probably, but it had a, an impact on the palm forest, the existing palm forest, because that palm forest depended on the annual flooding cycle of the Rio Grande. What year was that plantation? You got me. Probably, I, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, it's probably. Yeah. And he even built a brick bridge out there so that the workers could travel back and forth from the Brownsville area because that was a an area that did flood occasionally. Upstream. No, downstream. Downstream. Do you go to, uh, do you know where the Southmost area is? Southmost Road? Okay. Look for Southmost Road or just Google the, uh, the sanctuary, Sabal Palm Sanctuary. It's worth a visit. It really is. The border wall, you have to go through the border wall when you get there, but it's always open. There's just, they have guards there. Yeah, armed guards, they do. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't bother you. All right, it's nine o'clock, and I don't think I got halfway through this. Y'all are one of the best classes I've ever talked to. <laughs> Good feedback. Good feedback. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Yes. And I brought another one too. Let me show them real quick. One thing I want to show everybody, if you guys can see it, there's uh, this ancient landscapes of South Texas hiding in plain sight published by the CAPS organization with UTRGB. If you haven't gone to their exhibit, it is now at the International Museum, IMAS. Art and Science. Uh, they had the exhibit at UTRGB. We went to it. It's one thing to see the pictures, to see the book, which is fantastic, but then to go see the artifacts, the the uh, visit the places. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they they have the video there at the exhibit, but they're also supposed to release it on YouTube as well. So that's going to be really neat. But we have one of the professors that, that helped orchestrate, especially the geological side, which we love having them, Dr. Gonzalez, every year. But he's going to talk a lot about that volcanic ash that, that that's out there that is, a, is is really interesting. But he had a big contribution in this book from the geology perspective, and he's a really good. But if you haven't gone to that, they will have parts of this exhibit here later on in the year, which will be really neat for, for STEC to have as well. And check it out. You can visit. All, most of the sites that they do mention in that, and it's well worth it. We went on a tour with Dr. Gonzalez. He's now chair of Earth and Environmental Sciences there and at UTRGV. Speaking to the class on March 13th. Good. So on March 13th, we'll have Dr. Gonzalez. And then we have another book that this is published by Gorgas Science Foundation, and they've got it for sale there. I just bought another one, $40, and it's about the Rio Grande Valley Delta. I love it. It's, I read it, and then I forget about things, and I'll reread I'll re -read it again. And then one thing I brought, one show and tell, this is an oyster from up there, from Falcon Lake. But it wasn't, it wasn't a lake then. It was actually a lagoon on the shore of the Gulf of Mexico. Can you imagine this? It's uh, related to our oysters, the same genus, Crassostria, and our genus, our species is Crassostria virginica, but this one is Crassostrica gigantissima, which means big, <laughs> and it is a big oyster, and that's it. Thank you. What? Oh, 34 million years ago. I think 34. Muscle mantles. Again, let us know if you need your username and password for BMS so that you can get start playing with that. I am going to send a link out to everybody. There's an ebook. If you're interested about the history of the Rio Grande Valley, there's a really great ebook available out there to the public. And it takes you through a lot of the historic, important historical things about the valley. And it, okay. to me, it's a great little resource. It covers some of the things that we talked about. It has some really interesting pictures of what the valley used to look like at the time. It talks about the irrigation. It talks also about the early settlers. It's just a really, again, free to the public to use and look at. But to me, it's a really great representation of our history. And so I'll send that out to everybody sometime within, if not tonight, sometime tomorrow. All right. If there are no questions, thank you guys for, for being here, and we will be in touch with you before our next class next Wednesday. All right. Thank you all.